several adjustments on this tool also. We're just closing up. This is going to allow us. Hi, and thank you for watching. I want to talk a little about the Geneva Stopworks that found its way into so many of the antique clock and watch movements. We'll start out by covering what the two components that make up the stopwork look like and how they fit onto the mainspring arbor and barrel. And then we'll talk a little about what it was even good for in the first place. But it did serve a purpose, and it's actually amazing how such a simple design could make such a big difference in, in a timepiece's accuracy. We'll go through a few animations showing the mechanism in action, and then finally, uh, the most important of all, presetting the stop work mainspring tension so that it functions correctly. The first of the two pieces is the finger piece. Having a square hole, it fits a matching square on the end of the mainspring arbor and can only rotate with the arbor during winding. The second part is the Maltese, or star. The star I'm showing here has five spaces cut into it, leaving these five arms. You'll see Geneva stars with fewer and greater numbers of spaces and arms on both watches and clocks, but they all work the same way. Now, at the end of these four arms, there are concave cuts, with a fifth arm having a convex face. This convex face makes locking of the mechanism possible. We'll see that in action in just a bit. All of the animations that I'm going to show will have the Geneva Stopworks mounted down into a recess that's cut into the wheel or gear side of the mainspring barrel. By placing it down into this recess rather than on the outside surface of the barrel, the movement can be made thinner. It's also common to see the Stopworks mounted onto or into a barrel cap on the other side of the mainspring barrel here, or even on the plates of a clock. Whatever the setup, they all serve the same purpose of delivering the most even amount of power possible to the movement train by only using a certain portion of the mainspring. Let's take a look at a power curve in this torque chart to help visualize what's going on here. The mainspring we're discussing here is the older high carbon coil type mainspring that was found on all older watches and clocks before the advent of modern alloyed steels and special power compensating curves used on many modern springs. Now for the benefit of clarity, let's assume that we've wound six full turns of the mainspring to achieve this fully wound state. That's it, can't wind any further without breaking the spring. If permitted to rotate, the barrel can now turn a total of six revolutions until the mainspring is completely unwound. We put six winding turns in, so we get six full barrel revolutions out. So, at this point, we have a fully wound mainspring delivering its greatest power or torque. We can see here that this torque drops off very rapidly during the first revolution or so of the barrel and then begins to level off and descend less dramatically in torque without large fluctuations until we begin to approach the end of its winding where once again we see a sudden drop in torque at say the last barrel revolution. Or another way to look at it would be to say this section more or less represents the very first complete wind that was wound into the barrel. Okay, so again, if we have a completely unwound clock or watch uh, that needs six complete winding revolutions of the key or crown to achieve fully wound state, then this extreme section would represent the very first winding turn with this upper section representing the last winding turn. This would be covered more in depth in the, in the text section, but for now, it's enough to know that many of the older watches and clocks timekeeping ability, especially those using friction escapements like the cylinder or verge, don't do well in the timekeeping department when driven by fluctuating squirrely power source. They like an even source of power. This is where the Geneva Stopworks comes in. When set up correctly, these two extremes will be clipped out or taken out of action so that only this less variable portion is used to drive the movement. So again, if the mainspring allows six full turns and the clipped off extreme ends represent two total turns, then we're left with this usable midsection of four turns, which is capable of delivering four full barrel revolutions to the gear train. So by designing the movement to run, say, eight hours for each revolution of the barrel, 
we can see that the total of four revolutions will allow 32 hours running time on one full winding. And that 32 hour period will be driven by the flattest portion of the mainspring. A very simple yet effective design that had a big impact on horology. So let's see how it works. In the example that we just covered, we saw that the Geneva stop work will need to come into action right at the end of the fourth mainspring revolution, just at the point of completing its last barrel revolution of 32nd hour of runtime. This is where the arm having the convex face comes into play. We see here that this face has intercepted a locking shoulder on the finger, preventing any further rotation. If this locking didn't take place, then the barrel, after completing its fourth revolution, would continue to rotate another full turn using that last extreme power drop-off section of the mainspring, since there's still one complete wind left in the barrel. So at this point, the mainspring is ready to be wound again. Let's count the number of turns and see the stop work come into action now. Okay. One, two, three, Four, and the fifth turn is prevented from being wound onto the mainspring arbor. And the stop work has effectively canceled both extreme ends of the spring. Now let's take a look at the four barrel revolutions, remembering that each revolution represents eight hours of running time. One eight hour. Two, three eight hour, and lock, preventing the last extreme torque drop off section from engaging with only the central portion of the mainspring ever being used. Now, when the barrel completed its fourth revolution and was locked from going any further by the stop work, we still had that full wind of unused power left in the barrel. When we deactivate the stop work by removing the star wheel, this last wind of torque is released. Now that the mainspring is completely let down, we can check to see that the mainspring length allows for six full turns of the arbor by counting the winds until fully wound. And that's six. So at this point, the spring is fully wound around the arbor and can go no further. We can now set the stops in one of two ways. Now that the spring is fully wound, we can back it off the desired amount we want to clip off, which in our example is one full turn, and then set the stop in place. Or we can add some pretension at the very beginning of the winding process and then set our stops. I prefer setting the stops at the beginning because there's less tension to deal with when setting the stop, uh, which is nice when working with both hands, but really it doesn't matter which way you choose. We're gonna completely let down the spring now, preload some torque and set our stops. Okay, we're completely unwound. Now let's add one turn of of torque. Bring in our stop. And that's it. Now something to be aware of here is that splitting this into even amounts by clipping one wind from the beginning and one wind from the end isn't always the best proportion to use. A popular setup is two-thirds at the low end and one-third at the high end. We cover this more in the text section, as well as more in-depth techniques for determining what works best for a particular mainspring being used. But hopefully, this demo helped you understand what the Geneva stop work is used for and how it works.